Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, uh, Crossref annual meeting. We're celebrating our, our 15th uh, year. Um, we've changed things up a little bit uh, today. Usually we start off with the, the, uh, the Crossref stuff, but today I'm very pleased to say that uh, we've got two uh, excellent speakers uh, to get us started this morning. Uh, and then we'll hear for, uh, from uh, Crossref folks and then finish up the afternoon with another couple uh, external speakers. But to, to kick us off this morning, I'm very pleased uh, to introduce uh, Mark Abrahams, who's um, editor and co-founder of the magazine Annals of Improbable uh, Research and uh, well known for many, many other things. Uh, so over to you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Um, I'm here to tell you about some things and show you things and also to, I hope, gather some information from you that's your favorite information you have forgotten about. I'll, I'll show you some things and talk. Feel free to throw things or ask questions along the way. So this is our logo, uh, which either needs a lot of explanation or none. And I'm going to start with a little piece of video. I will do more details my, my Turn that up a little. Okay. Can we turn the sound level up, please? <laughs> this is an acceptance speech from someone who won an Ig Nobel Prize. I would like your own mask in 20 seconds to wonder who the lucky man is she's going to say. <laughs> she invented the emergency bra. Well, the times of naivety and unpreparedness have passed. We have learned to accept risk. <laughs> and we have learned to appreciate preparedness and prevention. That's why I always wear convertible bra mask. And when I am here next year, I hope every woman in this auditorium will also be wearing one. <laughs> Thank you very much. And now I believe we have a demonstration by the inventor. I would like to ask uh, for three volunteers, preferably Nobel laureates, to assist me in demonstration. I have a suggestion if you are going for an event like Ig Nobel where you can actually get surrounded by more than one Nobel laureate, you better have more than one bra. <laughs>
Ta -da. All right. I, I hope that you will agree that that deserves some kind of prize. And it got one. That's Dr. Elena Bodnar. She received the Ig Nobel Prize um, about seven or eight years ago. She, by the way, the reason she, th she thought of that in the first place, she grew up in Ukraine. She's a doctor. She had graduated from medical school when the Chernobyl power plant melted down. She was one of the doctors who treated people there. And they discovered over the years, the, many of those doctors who stayed in touch, that most of the bad medical damage at Chernobyl was not what they had expected. Most of the real bad stuff was not the direct radiation on skin, but it was radioactive particles people breathed in. That really did long-term horrible damage. So that's what got her thinking about some kind of something that might be available in an emergency that people didn't expect. And uh, you see the result here. She's started a company and doing, is doing quite well selling these, by the way. <laughs> Well, I'm here to talk about unexpected and overlooked things. That, that's what we deal with. Uh, my magazine is called Improbable Research. And uh, by improbable, I mean not what people expect. It's, uh, it's all about, well, here's the magazine. And, and by the way, I'll, I'll show you our old distribution system. I would bet almost nobody here, those of you who are from publishers, used quite the distribution system we used to use. <laughs> we, uh, we publish mostly citations and little snippets of all sorts of things. And as everybody in this room, I think, knows firsthand, there are all kinds of hidden gems that people, either nobody saw in the first place or almost nobody noticed or that got forgotten. If you find anything that, that is really worth your telling your best friends about, I would ask that you do one more thing. After you tell your three best friends, when you discover these great citations or great articles or whatever, drop us a line and we might spread the word a little bit more to the rest of the world. This is this phrase that you're seeing now, things that make people laugh and then think. That's what we're all about, things that have that dual quality, things that are so surprising that anybody's natural reaction to it at first is to laugh. But then a week later, it's still rattling around in your head and you want to tell somebody about it and, and argue about it. That's the thing that we look for that we write about in the magazine and some of the very best of those we give prizes to. The Ig Nobel Prizes, we started in 1991. That's when the first ceremony was held. It was at MIT, just across the river. Five years, four years later, we moved it down the road to Harvard, where it's been ever since. And it is about things that make people laugh and then think anything of any kind, but it's got to be real. And it has to do this to just about anybody. Uh, a couple of things before I, I give you more detail that it's sort of important to know. Um, we get lots of nominations every year. We get, in a typical year, something like 9,000 nominations for Ig Nobel Prizes. We give 10 prizes, not necessarily for recent things either. So the pool grows and grows over the years. And in almost all cases, when we choose somebody or a team to win an Ig Nobel Prize, we get in touch with them quietly and we offer it to them. We give them the chance to decline this great honor if they want. And if they say no, that's the end of it and we never tell anybody it never happened. But we're very happy that almost everybody who's offered a prize decides to accept. So here's what they get. If you are offered a prize and, and you accept, you get an Ig Nobel Prize. This is the prize that was given out this year. This year's ceremony was um, in September. The prize is different every year. It's always handmade, uh, always from extremely cheap material. We have a theme for the ceremony every year, not necessarily for the things that win. The theme this year was life, and the uh, prize itself reflects that. This is sort of the tree of life, and you can see the 
chemical uh, element symbols for the four most uh, prominent uh, ele chemical elements that are common to all known forms of life. And you get some other things. You also get a piece of paper that says you have won an Ig Nobel Prize. And that piece of paper is signed by several Nobel laureates. So it's a nice piece of paper to have. The Ig Nobel winners have a tradition that they started long ago. Many of them take the, the uh, paper home, get it put in a nice frame under glass, and then hang it in their home right above the toilet. Most prizes in the world also offer cash, and we were not able to do that because we don't have any money. But a few years ago, we figured out how to do that. And now every winner, or at least every team, gets money. They get a lot of money. They get $10 trillion. <laughs> they get a $10 trillion bill from Zimbabwe. The man responsible for printing those $10 uh, trillion bills, Dr. Gideon Gono, who is the head of the uh, National Bank in Zimbabwe, himself was awarded an Ig Nobel Prize for doing that. The ceremony happens in the building you see. This is Memorial Hall at uh, Harvard. It's the biggest meeting place at Harvard, biggest classroom, fits 1,100 people. On Ig Nobel night, it's always jammed to the rafters. The, the tickets sell out very quickly. We webcast it. Um, we were one of the very first things ever to webcast anything back 20, 21 years ago. And when you come there, when you look around, the uh, audience is uh, as unusual as the people on stage. This is uh, a look at the moment when a winner is announced. The winners are kept secret until we announce them on stage, and then they emerge through the sacred curtain and there's a Nobel laureate there waiting to shake their hands and hand them the Ig Nobel Prize. So that's what you're seeing here. Those particular winners are from the Netherlands. They won a prize because they published a paper. It could be in a journal published by one of you. I've forgotten which journal specifically. But their paper explained an experiment they did in which they treated um, asthma sufferers. They, they say they successfully treated the symptoms of asthma by taking the patients on a roller coaster ride. Okay, and one of them, as you can see, is blind, which added some, some color, <laughs> ironically, to this. Uh, this is a picture taken two months ago at uh, the most recent ceremony. And let's see, the five people on the left there are all Nobel laureates who are helping to hand out the Ig Nobel Prizes and also throw paper airplanes. Uh, the guy on the right there is a past Ig Nobel winner who came back to the ceremony. We, we encourage them to come back. People love to see them. Uh, if, you, if anybody here is from Japan, you probably are familiar with Dr. Nakamats. Any, is anybody from Japan? You know Dr. Nakamats? Yep. Can you sum him up in a sentence or two for people? Uh, he's, uh, uh, he, he's uh, what do you say, inventor. Uh-huh. Yeah, he's, he's got more than 3,500 patents. So many patents. <laughs> including things like flying shoes, shoes with springs on the bottom. That, uh, also, he has the patent, he says, for the first floppy disk in about 1950. It was made of wood. <laughs> <laughs> and we gave Dr. Nakamats a prize, not for any of his inventions, but because he, for, uh, let's see, he got the prize 10 years ago, and at that point he had taken a photograph of every meal he had consumed during the previous 35 years, now 45 years. Okay. And he is, I, th I think it's fair to say he's maybe the most famous person in Japan. Yeah. Yeah, and, and he, he usually gets more press attention than any of the other candidates, I think, doesn't yeah. he? Yeah. He sort of, imagine Donald Trump with intelligence, a sense of humor, and, <laughs> and, and kindliness, if you can imagine that combination. Uh, paper airplanes are a tradition at the ceremony. The audience started this the second or third year. Um, I'll give you a, a quick look. Um, this is from the ceremony a year ago. This is James Harkin. Uh, who um, is the head researcher for a TV program some of you may know called QI, and he was part of the, the show a couple years ago. The countdown begins in T minus seven seconds. 
T minus five, four, three, two, one, commence! Think for a moment about 1,100 people throwing paper airplanes for 90 minutes. It kind of loosens things up. And we invented, we've invented many things, but I think this may be our most valuable contribution to the world. The ceremony used to have the problem that almost every public event has, and which I'm sure you have suffered from in your lifetime many times. The event has a lot of people who are each going to give a speech. They are told please keep your speech very brief, and in our case, we mean really brief. About a minute is the maximum length that, that we, we will tolerate. Uh, but we didn't know how to keep them from going on and on, and you've seen that. Some of you organize things, and you, you've had to deal with this problem from the other end. But we solved that problem, and I'll show you how we solved that problem. As you know, we used to have a problem at this ceremony. Many of these speakers would exceed their allotted amount of time. Here's how we now solve that problem. Please welcome the charming, the delightful, the ever so cute Miss Sweetie Pooh. <laughs> Miss, Miss Sweetie Pooh is eight years old. Miss Sweetie Pooh, would you demonstrate what you will do when somebody exceeds his or her allotted time? Please stop. I'm bored. Please stop. I'm bored. Please stop. I'm bored. Thank you, Miss Sweetie Pooh. Please stop. Now, Miss Sweetie Pooh. I'm thank you, Miss Sweetie Pooh. Now, Miss Sweetie Pooh. Thank you, Miss Sweetie Pooh. Thank you, Miss Sweetie Pooh. Thank you, Miss Sweetie Pooh. That works. <laughs> Many of you know Amy Brand, who used to be part of CrossRef. Uh, and Amy's youngest daughter was Miss Sweetie Pooh a few years ago. Laraz, you may have met her. And every ceremony also includes, well, there are many things. We jam lots and lots of things, usually quick things, in between the announcements of the 10 new winners. And one of them at the ceremony every year is the Win a Date with a Nobel Laureate Contest. Each of the 1,100 people who buys a ticket has a chance to win a date with one of those Nobel laureates. I'll, I'll give you a quick look at that. This was uh, taken also at the most recent ceremony. This was our 25th ceremony, so we, we thought we should do a few extra special things. One of them was the contest this year. Uh, the prize was a package deal. It was not one, but two Nobel laureates. Carol Greider and Jack Shostak, who had won the prize together. So they came as a, a pair. They were the, the prize. And the next photo shows you the winner, chosen randomly from the audience, coming up to collect that prize. Right. You may be wondering about the man in silver <laughs> on the left. His name is Jim Brett. Uh, he has a PhD from MIT. He has invented, Jim Brett has, during his lifetime, two great things. One is what he's doing now. He, there are always two of them in the ceremony. They're called human spotlights. They, they take off most of their clothing, paint themselves silver or gold, and hold a flashlight where they illuminate the proceedings. So that's the human spotlight. Jim Brett invented that concept. He also is one of the people who invented something called 3D printing, three-dimensional printing. <laughs> Same guy. And here is the next moment when the winner was collecting her prize. We also write a little opera every year that's uh, part of the ceremony about some funny thing. We hope it's funny in science. We steal music from some classical opera and write a new story and words. The opera this past year, I'll show you just a little, about a minute from it. Uh, our theme this year was life. The opera was about people who organize a big televised event where they're going to choose from all the species of life, the millions and millions of species of life, choose which one of those species will be awarded 
the honor of being the best species of life. And they gather them all in one place, and they're taking a survey the day before of all these species. They're very proudly looking around this giant room, ticking off on their list which species are here, all of them. And then in the middle of it, something starts to go wrong. And you're going to see that minute when things turn very bad. It's the exact moment where they're, they're surveying the different things. And then they notice what had to happen if you were to gather all of the species in one room. Some of them start to eat other species. Some of them start to forcibly mate with other species. Some of them start to infect other species. And here we go. Fields and E. coli, nematodes and nautilus, asparagus, unknown vibes, tickleweed and tapeworms, hollyhocks and hogs, hogs, platypus and peanut worms, and redwoods and rubella, artichokes and anthrax, fireflies and frogs, And it goes downhill from there in spectacular <laughs> ways. The, if you want to see the rest of it, the video of all this stuff is up on the web, uh, the, the, the whole ceremony. Uh, very quickly, two past Ig Nobel winners that you may know about. A couple of years ago, we gave the medicine prize to a team of doctors from several countries. They're based in Detroit. And it was for the paper whose title you see here. This is a medical paper called Nasal Packing with Strips of Cured Pork as Treatment for Uncontrollable Epistaxis. Epistaxis means nosebleed, you know, with da-da-da-da. Uh, and I won't give you too much background on this, but it's an old treatment that they rediscovered and they found it works. This was one of our people on stage. We had a demonstration of it. <laughs> this always gets extensive press coverage, and all of the, the wire services send photographers, Reuters and AFP and Associated Press and all. All of those photographers caught this moment. The next day, this man was on news sites on the internet around the world, newspapers around the world. He was everywhere. <laughs> and we think this is probably the high point in his life. And the other, the other past winner I want to mention is this one. This, um, yes, you're familiar with this. <laughs> this is the, uh, the biology prize in 2003 was awarded to Case Muliker, who is the, uh, now the director of the Natural History Museum in the city of Rotterdam in the Netherlands. He studies birds. That's his profession. He noticed something unusual one day, took notes, and uh, wrote it up, and it became the study that you see here. This is the first scientifically recorded case of homosexual necrophilia in the mallard duck. And this is extensively documented. Uh, this is the museum where it happened. Uh, a is his office where he was. What happened was he heard a, a birds crash into the side of this building, which is glass on it, um, and, and the people who work there are used to bang sounds, but there was an unusually loud sound one day, and he was sitting at point A there, uh, he looked out the window and he saw what obviously had happened, a, a, a mallard duck had uh, flown into the side of the building at high speed, 
um, broken its neck and died and was on the ground. While he was watching, a second duck flew in, landed next to the first one, and began uh, engaging in activity. So uh, that's about point B there is where the collision happened. Uh, Case moved down to point C where he could look more closely and take photographs and notes for the next 75 minutes. A really quick look now at um, the newest winners. The chemistry prize this year went to a large team from Australia and the U.S. for inventing a chemical recipe to partially unboil an egg. This is their paper, uh, Shear Stress Mediated Refolding of Proteins from Aggregates and Inclusion Bodies. Here is the team at the moment that they were awarded the prize. The physics prize went to a team from the U.S. and Taiwan for testing the biological principle that nearly all mammals empty their bladders in about 21 <laughs> seconds, plus or minus 13 seconds. <laughs> Here's the paper that they published, Duration of Urination Does Not Change with Body Size. Uh, this is some detail from that paper. This is, uh, this is part of an elephant. And here is the team at the moment they were being handed their Ig Nobel Prize by a, a Nobel laureate. That's David Hu, uh, the team leader uh, who showed up with a toilet seat over his head. <laughs> the Ig Nobel Literature Prize, which I suppose should be dearest to the hearts of everybody in this room, went to a team that's based in the Netherlands. They are from several countries. They won, they were honored for discovering that the word ha, huh, or its equivalent, seems to exist in every human language. <laughs> and they were also honored for not being quite sure why that is. This is the paper they published. Is ha huh, a universal word? Conversational Infrastructure and the Convergent Evolution of Linguistic Items. They, most of the winners came to the ceremony. They were not able to travel that day. We, we did uh, arrange a ceremony a couple of weeks later in Europe. Um, but they sent a, a really short acceptance video to the ceremony, which we played. I'll, I'll show it to you now. Huh? Eh? Huh? Okay. Anyone like to see that again? The uh, Ig Nobel Prize in Management, it's not a field that we often give a, a prize in, but we did this year. The Ig Nobel Management Prize went to a, a team from several countries for discovering that many business leaders developed during childhood a fondness for risk-taking when they, when those particular business leaders experienced natural disasters like earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, tsunamis, and wildfires that for them had no dire personal consequences. This is the paper that describes that called What Doesn't Kill You Will Only Make You More Risk-Loving, Early Life Disasters and CEO Behavior. Some of you may have worked with some of these people. <laughs> Here are two members of the team uh, at the ceremony to collect their prize. The Ig Nobel Prize for Economics this year went to the Bangkok Metropolitan Police from Thailand for offering to pay policemen extra cash if the policemen refuse to take <laughs> bribes. Okay. This is the leader of the Metropolitan Police. The Ig Nobel Prize for Medicine this year was awarded jointly to two teams. One of them is one person in Japan, Dr. Kimata, and the other is a team that's based in the Czech Republic, or excuse me, in Slovakia. So they, they did very different things, and we're not even aware of each other, but they met uh, eventually at the ceremony, or actually two days later, and they were jointly honored for something that could be described in, in one simple way. 
they were all honored for experiments to study the biomedical benefits or biomedical consequences of intense kissing and other intimate interpersonal activities. There are a number of papers involved in this. This is the, the paper from the uh, team in Slovakia called Prevalence and Persistence of Male DNA Identified in Mixed Saliva Samples After Intense Kissing. Next time you watch any crime drama that involves um, taking samples uh, of, of spit and analyzing the DNA to identify the person, all of those got tossed out the window potentially because of this report. What they discovered is when two people kiss, if they exchange saliva, they also exchange DNA. And if you analyze the DNA you get from somebody's mouth, if they've kissed somebody within the previous hour and maybe longer than that, you're not going to be sure whose DNA you're measuring. So think back over the, the crime cases you've read about over the years and wonder. So that was the Slovakian team. Dr. Kimata in Japan had several papers that were part of this uh, that, that dealt with um, whether having a couple intensely kiss for 30 minutes would make their, their um, allergic symptoms go away or, or be less severe. And he also did a similar experiment, not just with kissing, but with sexual intercourse, as you can see from that other paper. So he's a brave experimenter, is Dr. Kimata. This is the Slovakian team receiving their prize. Ladies and gentlemen, and here's Dr. Kimata. I am Hajime Kimata from Japan. I am honored to be awarded the Nobel Prize and appreciate it very much. I wish that people would understand the new effect of kissing and also hope that kissing will bring not only love but also attention of allergic reaction. I look forward to meeting all of you. Thank you very much. When you're dealing with the papers that you're assigning numbers to or you're looking something up, pause a moment now and then and think that each one of those was written by one or more people. And just from reading the paper, you may not appreciate what their lab looks like, what their daily life is like. Uh, we asked the audience right after we presented that prize if they would stand and if, if they wanted to, any couples in the audience, and help demonstrate what would happen. And it turned out quite a number of them did want to help demonstrate. That's what you're looking at now. The Ig Nobel Prize for Mathematics was awarded to a team that's based in Vienna, Austria, for trying to use mathematical techniques to determine whether and how Moule Ismail, the bloodthirsty, the Sharifian emperor of Morocco, managed during the years from 1697 through 1727 to father 888 children. And here's the paper that goes into all the details of that. The paper's called The Case of Moulay Ismail, Fact or Fancy. This is the gentleman in question. <laughs> and some of you, uh, quite a few of you may be related to him. <laughs> and uh, this is uh, Elizabeth Oberzacher, who is one of the co-authors at the ceremony collecting her prize. And the Ig Nobel Biology Prize this year went to a large team that's based in Chile for observing that when you attach a weighted stick to the rear end of a chicken, the chicken then walks in a manner that's similar to that in which dinosaurs are thought to have walked. This is the paper about that, walking like dinosaurs, chickens with artificial tails provide clues about non-avian theropod locomotion. Here's some uh, detail from that paper, so you can see how this was done. This is a, a short video that's part of that paper, it shows you the research they did. It's a chicken without 
an artificial tail, and now a chicken with an artificial tail. <laughs> and at the ceremony, one of the research team <laughs> thought that it would be helpful for the audience to get a further demonstration oh. of this. Walk like a dinosaur? <laughs> so now the people is more vertical and the movement happens at the head. Thank you. We gave a prize in the field of diagnostic medicine this year to a large international team based in England. They won for determining that acute appendicitis can be accurately diagnosed by the amount of pain evident when the patient is driven over speed bumps. This is their paper, it was in BMJ, it's called Pain Over Speed Bumps in Diagnosis of Acute Appendicitis, Diagnostic Accuracy Study. And here are those doctors, a whole bunch of them flew over and pretty much insisted on giving a demonstration on stage. And the final prize we announced this year was in two categories melded together, jointly in the fields of physiology, and entomology, study of the body and how it works, and also of insects. It was awarded jointly to two individuals who had never met, although they knew each other's work very well and admire each other. And their work can be lumped together um, quite easily if you're describing it. They were honored for painstakingly, in the one case, creating the Schmidt Sting Pain Index which rates the relative pain people feel when they've been stung by various insects. That was Justin Schmidt's half of the prize. And the other half of the prize went to Michael Smith. No, no relation between Schmidt and Smith, but interesting, their names are similar. Michael Smith was honored for carefully arranging for honeybees to sting him repeatedly on 25 different locations on his body to learn which of those locations is the least painful. That turned out to be the skull, the middle toe tip, and the upper arm. And which locations on his body are the most painful to be stung on? Those turned out to be the nostril, the upper lip, and the penis shaft. This is Justin Schmidt's article. Um, which lays out the Schmidt Sting Pain Index. And this is Michael Smith's article, which came out just a year ago, um, detailing, well, this, locations on his body on which he was stung repeatedly. And here are the two of them at the Ig Nobel ceremony. Uh, and you can see Miss Sweetie Pooh was helping to remind them their speech had gone on long enough. And this being our 25th year, one of the other special things we did was invite back all of the people who had been Miss Sweetie Poos in previous years. And they now range in age from eight, the current Miss Sweetie Poo, to about 25 or six. She's now a tall, willowy nurse. And they're all, or most of them, in that picture. And one of them is Amy Brand's daughter. And uh, here again are some uh, pictures of, of covers of the magazine. Um, I, I'm hopeful that one or several of the people in this room know of people who deserve Ig Nobel Prizes. And you can nominate yourself if you like. Many people do. Um, every year, between 10 and 20 percent of the nominations are people nominating themselves. But they almost never win. If you're trying to win one of these prizes, you will almost certainly fail. This is a, a side effect, this quality. But if you know of somebody who should get a prize, I hope you will let us know. Tell me later, drop us a line, whatever. We get a lot of nominations from institutions for their people and also from journals. The reason for that, I think, the main reason is that beginning pretty early in, in, in the, the history of the Ig Nobel Prizes, a few, and now a lot, of the people who get these prizes have gotten lots of publicity. And in some cases, that has dramatically affected their career, almost always for the better. 
uh, opened up new doors, new jobs, uh, publishing offers, TV careers, all sorts of things. There's no guarantee that happens, but uh, if, if you're connected with a journal that has, shall we say, obscure um, subject matter and papers that, that may strike people as what the hell kinds of papers, and, and those strike in many directions, and you think some of them really ought to be better known, and they make you laugh and then think, and then maybe you should let us know about those things. Well, that's pretty much what I, I brought to tell you. Um, I do also want to say that as a publisher, which is one of the many things I am, we um, have just announced that we are abandoning paper and we're going all PDFs. And uh, we came up with a, a, a new simple method to, to solve a problem that I know some of you have solved in other ways about how do you make a PDF readable in a comfortable way on a tiny screen? And we, we figured out a way to do that. If anybody wants to talk about that later, I'd be delighted and catch me in the hall or something. So anyway, thank you very much for inviting me today and uh, please keep up the good work on all the stuff you're doing. Thanks. <laughs> And thanks for the paper airplanes. Is there time for questions? Okay. Okay. Um, does anybody have any questions or complaints? <laughs> and maybe if we get, could we have the lights turned up too, please? Yeah. Questions, complaints, um, requests for food, anything? Yeah. Are there any um, intellectual property restrictions on your use of the phrase Nobel Prize? Is it, is Nobel uh, questions: Are there any intellectual property restrictions on the use of our uh, on the inclusion of Nobel in Ig Nobel? Um, depends on who you talk to. If you talk to a lawyer who is billing you when you ask the question, then <laughs> the answer to that is: You know, that's an interesting question. <laughs> Please sit down. Uh, we've never run into any problem, and we have from the the very beginning. Really, the top of our list of things to be careful about is to always do everything we can to make sure nobody in his or her right mind will at all confuse what we're doing with the Nobels uh, and to always be extremely respectful of them. And a lot of nice things have happened over the years, including the, the past several years. Um, we have been invited to do shows, me and a bunch of Ig Nobel winners at the Karolinska Institute, where a lot of those decisions are made. And we've had some nice, very unofficial uh, contacts with some of the Nobel people. And they, they seem to feel pretty comfortable that we're there to make the world appreciate them all the more. <laughs> we are a nice contrast. But yeah, good question. Um, there was a question here and then back there. Is, yeah, is, the, is the prize restricted to people who've just published journal papers or peer-reviewed papers? No not restricted to anything except you, to real people. Um, it doesn't have to be for science. It doesn't have to be for a paper. It can be for anything. We have awarded the prize to children occasionally. There was um, a group in, uh, of, of Boy Scouts in France about 20 years ago that um, won an Ig Nobel Prize because they went to a cave in southern France that has some of the oldest cave paintings ever discovered. And um, they, they decided it was graffiti and that they would clean it. And so they did. And uh, they were awarded, I think, the Ig Nobel Literature Prize <laughs> for that. So no, almost no restrictions of any kind. I think I know the answer to this. Uh, have, has anyone ever won both a Nobel and an Ig Nobel? Yeah. The, uh, there, uh, the answer is. Yes, there are two people who have done that. One of them is, is more technical than uh, anything else. And um, that's uh, Bart Knowles, who, before he got his Ig Nobel Prize, had worked for a UN agency that was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. And that was awarded to each of the thousands of people who are employees there. So technically, he had a piece of a Nobel Prize. but. That's very iffy. He got his Ig Nobel Prize because he and a colleague had done an extensive series of tests. They study malaria. And they'd done a series of tests to see what attracts the mosquitoes that carry malaria. Uh, their, their experiments uh, all involved having a naked person spend a night 
in a tent in which there were hundreds of malaria mosquitoes. And in the morning, they would count up on the body where the, the bites were. They discovered that two odors strongly attract malaria mosquitoes, the odor of human feet and the odor of um, Limburger cheese. But that's the one who only sort of won both. The other case is Andre Geim, who's now a professor at the University of Manchester in the UK. Year 2000, we awarded him and another physicist the Ig Nobel Physics Prize because they used magnets to levitate a frog. And you may have seen the video of that on the internet. Um, no physicist would have said that was possible. And uh, now they know it is. And that, that did some interesting things. Ten years later, though, ten years after he was awarded the Ig Nobel Prize for physics, Andre Geim was awarded the Nobel Prize for physics for something else. That was he and one of his grad students were the first ones to isolate a, a substance called graphene, which you may know about, may have, have read about which is the, the two-dimensional form of carbon. Everybody knew it existed, but nobody had been able to get any. And they had a goofy-sounding experiment to do that. Um, you know, it, it's in, it's in uh, graphite, the stuff that's in your pencil. And pretty much everybody has taken a pencil and scribbled on a piece of paper, and then um, you, know, you flex it or you take a piece of tape and, and it picks up some of that gray stuff. Well, that's what they did. And then they flexed the tape over and over and over, and as they did that, little bits of this stuff flew off, and they put some of it under a microscope, and they realized they had been the first ones who knowingly isolated some of these flat, one-atom thick sheets of graphene. That's now starting industries around the world. So yeah, that, uh, the, uh, the answer yes <laughs> to the question. Yeah. Maybe one more question if there is one? And maybe none if there isn't. OK, thank you very much.